morning, everybody. And we'll wait a couple minutes. Everyone get here. And then we will proceed back to King Lear. You can all hear me, right? Yes. Um, so I'm being asked if you can record the lecture. Yes, I, I have to set that up for you though, right? Um, how do I do that? Hold on. I know I did this once before. Huh. How do I do that? should be able to that. All right. Yeah, no, I don't have a problem with that since um, obviously, yeah, so you you should be set to do it, I see. Because um, again, sometimes this converts and other times it doesn't, so that's fine. All right, while we're waiting, a couple more minutes. How's it going with Lear? You were all very, very quiet last week. Um, yeah, I think, Tharani, do you want me to set it up so that you can record as well? I think I can, hold on. Um, I just did it. I can't remember how I did it. I think you can do it now. Sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak up? No, it says uh, if I if I if I click uh, record, it says I have to ask your permission for you. Yeah, I don't know how to set it for anyone. Does anyone want me to set it so you can record this? Yes, or are you gonna record it and post it? Post it? I, I I try to post it every time. It always records. Yes. The problem is converting the recording into a file that then can be seen. It's, it's, it's a problem in all my classes. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I, I've talked with the IT people over at the at TAB and no one seems to be able to figure out why. Um, if it's something to do with my computer or I, I have a meeting tomorrow uh, where I'm going to bring it up again and hopefully figure out if it's something I'm doing on my end. But sometimes it does. That's what's so weird about it. And I do the exact same thing every time. 
So uh, hopefully I can get it resolved tomorrow. On that note, I do have, but we have a big meeting tomorrow to discuss a number of things, but also to discuss um, the final exams. So it looks like the final exams are gonna be online. We will be having the final exam um, through Zoom on our last day of class. But there may be some changes, some differences compared to the midterm. One is it looks like you will all be required to share your screens. And again, I'll have more information after my meeting tomorrow, which I'll relay to you. But um, it looks like if you're not sharing your screen, no matter what the reason, I can't let you take the exam. You have to have a computer. You're not gonna be able to share your screen with an iPad or a phone. So everyone really, you need to ensure that you can do this. If you can't, because you don't have the, the equipment or whatever to do it, then you have to make arrangements to take the exam at the college. They're really being strict about this, all right? There were a number of issues from the midterm across the board. Um, so be sure you have a camera, proper computer, and the ability to share your screen. Yeah, no, there, it's, a, it's a good question, Asif. Um, no, they're, they're insisting that it's done in class, that you a four-hour exam on camera. Uh, I know if you've had me before, I have often allowed for a take-home exam for the final exam. Uh, they're not letting us. I, I mean, if, if that changes, I'll advocate for that. I, I prefer that. Gives you more time. Uh, you're out of that pressure cooker of, of an exam room and so on. Um, and you inevitably will produce better work if you have a week to work on it. But um, as it stands, yes, I know, but I don't think they're gonna let me. I'm gonna bring it up tomorrow at the meeting that we have. But I brought it up at the midterm as well. And, and they're saying uh, not under these circumstances, whatever their rationale is. And they are looking to make sure it's, you know, it, it's across the board, that everyone's following the same rules and regulations when it comes to the exams. So you have to anticipate four hour in-class pressure cooker like the midterm with really I, strict rules and regulations um, that you're gonna have to follow. So expect it to be even more rigid than the midterm, all right? Um, Again, I'll have more information after our um, after the meeting tomorrow. I will also ask and get as much information as they can give me concerning your exit exam on December 16th. All right, since you're asking about that as well, everyone's asking from other classes. And that's, that's why we have this meeting tomorrow, is to really get all these things settled. You, you know, there are so many things that have always, that remain up in the air because of the situation we're in. Uh, so, but after tomorrow, I should have clarity, as much clarity as they can give me. Um, and I know it, it's, it's confusing for, for you guys um, in a situation that's already difficult. And, um, We'll see how the meeting goes tomorrow. I, I certainly am advocating to make things as simple and as straightforward for you guys as we can. Um, that's always, I think you've gathered that. That's, that's my approach. But I, I, have to, I have to follow the rules as they come down from up top. But I will advocate, again, because last, the midterm, they were insisting that you had to handwrite your, your exam and then take a picture, scan it, whatever, convert it and send it to me. Um, and I advocated strongly against that, but that may come up again. Um, you know, one of, one of the problems is that there's, you know, all it takes is a few to take advantage. 
and then it, it really impacts everyone. All right? And what I mean by take advantage is it all takes is a few people cheating. And, and then everyone has to then conform with stricter rules. All right. So um, again, I should have certainly more clarity. I don't know if it'll be perfect clarity, but certainly more clarity um, after tomorrow. And I will let you guys know um, from there. Okay. Any other questions regarding the exam? Remember, you're responsible for both Julius Caesar and King Lear. Are there any other questions about our exam? Okay. Ah. Um, any questions or concerns or observations or comments about Lear? Again, last week you were all very quiet and that's concerning me and I can't see your faces. I don't know what's going on. I need you to talk to me. How is it going? It's going good. Okay, uh, is, it, is it getting a little easier? You're able to follow the plot? Yes, it's, yeah, it's a little bit easier. Like, just like, the, like the act two is like, it's easier to explain it's more what it's doing and all that. Okay, is, is, how, how are other people feeling about that? I mean, if you're still struggling with it, tell me. Um, I mean, there's a lot going on in this play. It is more challenging than our previous plays, both in terms of its language um, and in terms of the, uh, um, the action. Right? There's a lot going on. Remember, we have two plots. We have the main plot, and then we have the subplot, but they work very much hand in hand. And one of the things that I was mentioning last week, and I really want to emphasize this, is you want to see the similarities in the plots. See how they relate to each other, and keep track of that as you proceed through the play see how they're going to converge. But it's important to be able to recognize the similar themes, right? We have the Gloucester and his two sons, Edgar and Edmund, and then we have Lear and his three daughters, right? And as we know now that we've gotten through, or so hopefully most of you have, Act Two, right? That we're seeing how Gloucester is rejecting Edgar, because of Edmund's manipulations. And we know that Lear rejects Cordelia and both Cordelia and Edgar are faithful, loving children who are now been rejected by their fathers, all right? One, that's the similarity, but of course there's differences. We have with Gloucester, Edmund manipulating the situation. Right, we looked at that soliloquy that Edmund has, where he explains why, because he is the bastard child. He's not, by law, the laws of that society, um, allowed to uh, benefit as a child normally would benefit from inheritance and things like that. Um, and he rails against that system. And, okay, good question, Valerie. We're going to come to that. Why was Kent put in the stocks? Um, but again, keep, keep in mind, Edmund is, is really a, a central character that you should be recognizing some uh, similarities with, with Iago, just in terms of how manipulative and, and controlling he is. But the difference, and I emphasize this, is we know why Edmund is doing what he's doing. We're never clearly sure why Iago does what he does, right? It could be because he was passed up for promotion. It could be because of the rumors that Othello had an affair with his wife. But we're never, it's never made clear. Edmund tells us right from the start, this is why I'm doing it, right? And of course, when we look at that in comparison to the main plot, 
nobody is manipulating Lear in terms of his rejection of Cordelia. So there is that difference, all right? And it's very much, whereas Gloucester is a bit pathetic in terms of how easily Edmund can manipulate him into turning against Edgar, Lear brings it on himself, all right? Again, we come back to that opening, just the idea that he is going to divide his kingdom, but still wants to maintain his authority. Right? And then he engages in that contest. Which of thee doth love me most? All right? So it, it alerts us. We, we, we're, we're meant to recognize, hey, Lear, you know, that's, why are you doing that? And remember how Lear responds when Goneril and Reagan flatter him. Go way over the top in, in, in expressing their love. He embraces that. Is that because he doesn't recognize that they're embellishing just to flatter him? It alerts us that, you know, there's something going on with Lear. And Lear is older, right? But Gloucester is, you know, pretty old as well. But we have to start noticing with Lear the, um, how his behavior is a reflection of an unstable attitude, unstable mind, already at the beginning, and just by the fact that he is going to divide his kingdom, because that act in itself is disruptive, right? And then we throw into the mix that he also expects to still have the same authority when he is in the process of dividing his kingdom, giving up that authority. And we see that playing out of the end of act one and into act two. The authority now is with his two elder daughters. Cordelia is off in France. She's out of the picture. The kingdom has been split in two. Ironically, of course, because he's saying, I want you know, to ensure that we don't have any disputes, this fosters dispute, div division, divide and rule, or divide and conquer, rather. Right, so you should be being attentive to seeing how that friction and that conflict um, is developing. We get some hints of it in Act Two, right? Um, and how Lear is responding to the disrespectful behavior that his daughters are showing him, right? And that, that ties in to arguably the disrespectful behavior they exhibited when they flattered him. Remember Cordelia saying, you know, what should I say here? I, am I gonna lie like my sisters? If you lie, even embellishment is a type of lie, then you are, whoever you're lying to, you're disrespecting them. And Cordelia cannot lie. That's why she says nothing. Lear's response, nothing will come from nothing. But of course, the fact is, she's giving him much more. She's giving him something that the other sisters don't give him, which is honesty and respect that Lear can't recognize, right? That Kent recognizes that the fool recognizes, and we have to spend some time with the fool today. Um, but when Kent points it out to Lear, he's banished. Um, the fool can get away with it because of his status as that special type of character um, that can get away with saying um, or challenging Lear because he's a fool. He's the court jester can hide it, mask it to some degree in his comedic role. Um, but he's telling Lear, he's there for us as well, kind of in, in, in a sense, like a, a, um, a chorus in, in, a, in, in 
Greek tragedies, ancient Greek tragedies, no. to remind us and to remind Lear. No. And he calls Lear out on these things. And of course, it's for our benefit as well that we're become more cognizant of the um, well, the odd, let's go with that, odd behavior of Lear. And we have to be wondering how is he not aware? Right? Even when we get into Act 2 when, um, with the putting Kent in the stock, again, we will look at that closely. Um, he, he, how does Lear respond to that? He's outraged. How can, you know, you don't put the king's servant uh, and punish him like that without checking with me, the king, first. That's, that's my guy. And he still tries to rationalize it because, okay, maybe they're not feeling well. People do strange things when they're not feeling well. Uh, but of course, it's we, we've seen that disrespect earlier with Goneril, right? and we're going to see that when they're saying to, to Lear, well, what do you need 100? You need, you know, 50 is fine, and then that, where does that 50 dissolve into? What do you need anyone for? When you're here, you know, we'll take care of you. You don't need your own knights, your own entourage. But of course, that's what Lear insisted on when he was dividing his kingdom. But he had the authority before he divided the kingdom. But once that is done, he no longer has the authority. But he thinks he does. That's one of the great flaws of his character. That's what the fool keeps reminding him. You brought this on yourself, Lear. You, 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 you gave the power to your children. Now your roles have been reversed. You're the child. They're the adults. And yes, the fool, the fool is the only wise man. I don't know if he's the only wise man, but um, he certainly appears to be much wiser than Lear. Uh, and again, it, 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 the, the fool is challenging because he reveals his critique of Lear you know, through the songs that he sings and in, in, in the punning he does with language. So it, it's challenging to sift through that. And we may uh, today look at some clips of that interaction between Lear and the fool. Why, why was Kent put in the stock? Let's, 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 let's go at it before we go to the text. That was the question that came up. Why, why is Kent in disguise? Always remember, Kent is in disguise because he's been banished. No one knows it's Kent. He was insulting one of the, right. I don't know the name. Oswald. Oswald. He was insulting him because of that and he, he drew his sword. He was attacking him. That's why he was being right. Attacked. And he insults Regina and the colonel. They call them their bastard. Right. I mean, you remember who Oswald is. Oswald is back in Act One. Lear, because Oswald is being um, well. Let's look at. It. I don't want to jump around too much, but yeah. One of the things to notice with, with Kent and his behavior, right, if, and we'll look at that a little more closely, when he, when he attacks and insults, and it's amazing, it's insults, um, and we'll look at that language, why is he so aggressive? Because he's loyal to the king. Because he's loyal to the king, but even being loyal to the king. He's defending him. Even in defending him, but the question we ask with, and it's, and it's a tough one, is does he go over the top? Does he deserve that punishment? Yes, he's loyal to the king, but <clears throat> Oswald doesn't draw on him. Oswald says, I don't want to fight you. Oswald doesn't seem to recognize him from previous scenes. 
And there is the question of, you know, does this Kent go too far with this? This is something to be attentive to because we're always, when we look at Gonriel and Regan and their behavior and the actions that they take, are they justified in taking those actions? Or are they just mean, power hungry? Right? You wanna be asking that because if they are now the authority, because that authority has been bestowed upon them by the king. And one of the king's servants attacks one of their servants, the whole argument that Lear makes, you can't do this, I'm, I'm the king, I'm the authority. Well, they can say the same thing. Well, in fact, no, we're in charge now and your guy attacked our guy and then was insulting and unrepentant and really over the top, a bit out of control. If Lear is still king with that authority, no, no one has a right, right, to, to, to punish his man. But it's an example of how he no longer does have that authority, so that's on one level. But on another level is, were they justified in putting Kent in stock? Well, that's, that's, that's one of the questions we'll look at because it, it, it's, it's inconceivable to Lear because Lear is still stuck in this mindset that he is still the king when he's not. Maybe they feel like he's not showing respect to them? Well, yes, the, 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 there's, there's this idea of respect that runs throughout. Lear is demanding that he still be shown this kind of respect that he would get if he was king. But now that he no longer has that absolute authority, then any kind of respect has to be earned. And arguably Kent's behavior towards Oswald is wrong. Oswald is just doing what he's been told to do by who he works for. It's important to keep that in mind because as things disintegrate and they will disintegrate, right? We are asking our question, we are asking the question is who's right and who's wrong? Now, be prepared. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm wanting you to reflect on that now because then when we see the action really build, and we're getting a little bit of a hint of that in Act 2, hey, remember, the two plots, right? Where do they converge? And now we're seeing where, where's all, where, where are they all, all this happening um, in Act 2? Whose house? Whose castle? Uh. Okay. Edmund's father's? Yes, Gloucester. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Yes. All right, so we're going to see now how Gloucester is going to get involved. Because Gloucester, even though he's being duped by Edmund, Edmund's very good at what he's doing, just like Iago was. Okay. But Gloucester is also recognizing how this conflict that's developing between Lear and his daughters. Is, is a problem, right? So we wanna watch carefully how he chooses and what he attempts to do to um, get involved in that plot line while he's also dealing with his own plot line with his two sons. Right? What else? What else is on your minds with this? It was good, I, I really, encourage you to ask these questions or make observations, whether it's through the chat or whether you unmike yourself. It makes, a, it makes a big difference and gives me um, much more to work with in terms of how to proceed through this so it's just not mechanical going through scene by scene. I mean, what do you, what do you, what do you guys think of God, Real, and Regan at this point? 
Now we're seeing their true colors. Now they're more powerful. What we're seeing there. Um, the attention towards their father. Right, their true colors. What? So what are their true colors? Uh, now they have more power. Now they can do whatever they want, which is like, they know that like the king doesn't have a power. And right. But that again comes back to, oh, we got a question here on like, why doesn't Lear realize he doesn't need his knights? Does he need the knights? Why does he want the knights to begin with? What do the knights represent for Lear? Is he still a king? Like he still has a power certain amount, I'm assuming? Yeah. I mean, the, the idea, of course, he doesn't need them, um, but they're, they're, they're part of what he needs in order to maintain his understanding of his identity as a king. He doesn't know anything other than to be a king. The knights represent that. This is his entourage. Of course, the logic that the sisters come up with works. What do you need all these knights for? When you're here, we have all of our people take care of you. All your needs will be taken care of. But that's not why Lear wants his knights. It's a, it's, it's a symbol. The knights, the hundred knights, are a symbol of his authority. So when we see the daughters whittle that down from 100 to 50 and then further down from there, it's them using their authority, not just to take the authority away from Lear, because Lear's already given that authority away himself. It's a symbolic way of letting Lear know that he no longer has that authority. Okay? So, right, it works on that literal and figurative, right, level all the way through. And, it, and again, and then it ties in with characterization. That's why I asked, what do you think of or they're showing their true colors, but are they being unreasonable here? Right, King Lear's coming to their house with his hundred knights and, you know, they're loud, boisterous, seemingly partying all the time. They're disruptive, right? Remember Lear said, I, I've tossed off all the burdens. I don't have to worry about anything anymore, but I still want my authority, right? That's, that's where the problem comes in. The, if you maintain that authority, then you have to still have those burdens. If you give up those burdens, then you no longer have the authority. And this is something that um, Lear doesn't seem to understand. And we have to ask ourselves why. Right? You know, use the question, why doesn't Lear realize he doesn't need his knights? Why doesn't Lear realize that disowning Cordelia is, is outrageous? Kent knows it right away. So it, it gives us some insight right from the beginning into Lear's state of mind. And if you notice how many times Lear is in his frustration, he's quite the um, uh, demonstrative, and emotional individual. And in his rages, right, quick-tempered and raging, we see him a couple times saying, I'll, I'll, I'll go mad. So is he going mad? And if so, has that madness already started? What's the nature of that madness? Is it some form of uh, uh, senility? Right. And again, with the, uh, yes, it is foreshadowing. Right. So you can see some of the more famous Shakespearean moments up on the heath, calling out to nature. And of course, don't forget, nature, that ties into both plots. Uh, but yes, it is, uh, you, again, you want to be anticipating that there's something, well, not anticipating, but we're, we're, what's being revealed is our elements of Lear's personality, right, for, you know, again, right from the start, that we have to attempt to put ourselves 
at this stage into Gonreal and Regan's uh, minds when we see how they act. Because how do we interpret that now before we see what develops? Are they wrong? All right. As you, you're, you're familiar, you're, you're, it's, it's, as he was saying, um, the storm, right, which we're going to be coming up to next week, All right? But when we get to the, the famous storm scene with Lear, also be being attentive to where Gloucester's going to be at that point. And what, of course, all this is touching on is this idea of awareness. Is Lear really unaware of what he's done? Now, if you think back to Cordelia, remember she has those asides, what should I say? What do I do here? She's aware that if she is truthful, that there are going to be repercussions. She knows her father well enough to know that he's not going to react well if I say nothing. she chooses to do anyways and, and deals with those repercussions. But again, um, awareness. Gonreal and Regan are very much aware. They are aware that what their father wants to hear is exactly what they tell him. Kent is aware. The fool is very aware. But Lear doesn't seem to be so. And that ties in with Gloucester. For different reasons, Gloucester, who is very aware of many things, but he's not aware, he can't see what Edmund is doing. All right, so when we think of awareness, we think of eyes, right? To see. To see is to be aware. All these themes and ideas are all being presented to us in these first two acts. And they're coming at us from all kinds of angles. But we need to sort them out. Yeah. Well, we'll see when we get to the storm, right? Because, if it, it, I mean, obviously some of you, it would appear, have read ahead. And, and that's good. I encourage you to because the sooner you finish it, um, you know, the more, the, the more it'll be clear, <laughs> the more aware uh, you'll be of things. But at the same time, going through it in this process slowly to be able to absorb so many of these other things that are going on in preparation for when the action continues and becomes even more intense. And as long as you're thinking of these themes, awareness, authority, um, and you see how that impacts the other characters. So that's why I keep coming back. At this stage, what are we thinking about Gonreal and Reagan? Again, they, you know, all right, you know, geez, you're being a little harsh on your dad. Uh, but yeah, you know, reasonable, hard, tough, tough love here. But look at their positions. And of course, be attentive to their husbands. Okay. Um, remember now, they're, they are sharing this divided kingdom. So we're going to have brought into the mix uh, themes of ambition and power. Right? And of course, the looming um, theme of madness. What else?
Why is it that France did not pay the dowry for Gadir? Only the father can pay the dowry, right? The a dowry comes from the bride's father, right? A very standard practice in which um, it's one of the reasons that one of the things that makes that the daughter attractive is not just who she is, but she comes with a dowry, right? So France, if you remember back into that scene, accepts her without a dowry, right? And even goes so far as to say, you know, now that you don't have money and you don't have position and you don't have lands, you're even more attractive because now you are attractive and I'm in love with you for you which of course ties into what Cordelia's whole motivation for saying nothing, right? Uh, nothing stripped down bare without all the accrement that we carry, the baggage is when you get to see who someone truly is. Keep that in mind when you see people ripping off their clothes in, in, in front of nature. It's stripping themselves down to the bare essence of who they are. By taking away the dowry for Cordelia, she is exposed to as who she actually is. And France says, that's what I love. Come with me. Well, what did he see in her to accept without the dowry? An honest, attractive, thoughtful person. Love. If you go back and I guess we could somewhat tie it into remember Othello's speech about love. What really is love? It's not tied up with how much money you have or what kind of clothes you're wearing. It's who you are. <clears throat> so we're seeing. Um, France accepting Cordelia when she is stripped down to the, her essence of who she is. She no longer has all that stuff that comes with being the daughter of the king because the king disowns her and takes away all her lands and money. Keep that in mind when we get to, you know, the idea of knowing thyself, if you will, right? drawn Polonius from Hamlet, right? Notice how Edmund does the same thing. When Edmund has that soliloquy, um, he is making choices by, through his acknowledgement of his position within this society. And there's a certain intense ironically, honesty in Edmund. He's dishonest with everyone around him. He's manipulating, he's lying to his father, he's lying to Edgar, he's setting them one against the other. But he's honest with himself. Um, and that's important to remember because we come back to Lear and is Lear capable of that kind of honesty because he doesn't seem to realize who he actually is anymore. And he's given up his identity. And he's given it up without realizing what the consequences could and will be. Because he doesn't know any other identity. And that's what sets him down on this path which he brought on himself. And again, that, when we look and compare him, because obviously we're, we're thinking of comparing Lear and Gloucester, right? And when we look at the mirrored plots, you know, Gloucester's the father, Lear's the father, Edmund and Edgar are the children, God and, and Cordelia are the children. So we're looking to compare them. And, you know, we, we can't escape comparing Lear and Gloucester. And their 
culpability in their own fates. That's the other thing, right? I, I, there's a lot here. <laughs> fortune. You know, you're going to see references to uh, fortune, fate, the wheel of fortune. All right. So this is another theme that's being explored. How much control? We've seen this before, right? How much control does the individual have over their own fate? And getting and, and and their ability to see themselves as they truly are. And we play that's being played with as well. Like if you look at Kent, right? Kent has to go in disguise. He can't be who he truly is. Because he's been banished. And Kent's an intriguing character. I come back again to the whole bit with the with the stockade. Um, and which we will look at um, is he being unreasonable? It was he being unreasonable at the beginning when he challenged the king. I mean, he actually says, what are you, you mad, you old man? So there's a, there's, there's a similarity there in terms of a, a rashness, um, a temperament, He was telling the truth, as Cordelia was telling the truth, as Regan and Glanriel were not telling the truth. They were telling what they knew the king wanted to hear. And who else is telling the truth all along? The fool. Because now with Kent, even though Kent is still around, He's not himself. He's in disguise. Right? And that, that needs to be taken note of. So what he's doing, what he says, how he behaves is Kent in disguise. It's not him stripped bare and being fully honest. Even if he says honest things, it's coming from an area of dishonesty because he's in disguise. And is by going in disguise, does that um, depreciate his sense of self in terms of that honesty? He comes back again. Is he overreacting when he attacks Oswald? Again, these are not, you know. It, 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 not simple things to, do, to determine at this stage, right? Um, no, and Lear doesn't like hearing the truth. Obviously, that comes back to the nothing, right? And, and the nothing is actually, obviously, quite something. Right? Nothing will come from nothing. Well, yes, but it's not that there's nothing here. What constitutes nothing? Keep that in mind when it comes back and ties into this idea of stripping yourself bare of all the um, paraphernalia that we carry with ourselves that can hide from us our, 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 our true understanding of the self. Um, you got the idea, the only way you can really know yourself is if you pull that stuff away. And that's obviously a, a process that Lear's going through. Not, not, not consciously trying to, but the circumstances are lead, lead, leading him to be stripped of all those additions. And we see that again with his knights. 100 to 50 and down further and further. It's a process by which these means by which Lear identifies his, himself. His identity is determined by his authority and his knights and um, his, his ability to do as he pleases as king. Well, that's all being taken away from him. Being taken away from him, but through a process that he himself initiates without realizing it. 
And that's again comes back to one of the, the big issues is how could he not realize what his daughters realize it? They know, and their husbands know that Lear is giving up his power and his authority. Why can't Lear realize it? And how many people do fully realize that in here? Because Kent's reaction is not so much to the division of the of, of the kingdom, but specifically Lear's attitude response to Kent's concern is with Lear's, the way Lear treated Cordelia. But again, as I keep coming back, just the act of dividing the kingdom is in itself, dare I say it, foolish. All right, what else? Anyone? I, I think uh, we see a letter, like Kenneth received a letter from, uh, I forget the name. From? I forget the name of it. <laughs> Kent yeah. receives a letter from Cordelia, right? Yeah. Like that's kind of like a foreshadowing. It tells us like things is gonna get better or worse. Like kind of a hint that she would come. She would come back. Well, it's 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 a what 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 she's basically saying in that letter is you know I'm because remember she's she just married the king of France, right? So she's given up all her titles and claims in in Lear's kingdom, but she's still very much in a position of power by marrying a king of France. And what she's suggesting is, you know, she will see what she can do to advocate for France to keep an eye and to help out what may be unfolding in Lear's, well, not Lear's kingdom anymore, in Gonville and Regan's kingdom. Right? Yes, and that is a bit of foreshadowing and also demonstration that Cordelia is still lurking. Um, and of course, we're seeing little hints along the way, and you have to be attentive to them. Uh, now that Lear is getting pretty angry at Gonriel and Regan, that he's starting to think back on Cordelia. Because remember what he says in, the, in that opening scene, um, that you know, Cordelia is his favorite. Are uh, the other sisters jealous of Cordelia? Do we get that sense that they're jealous? Jealous of what? Uh, she's, you know, to, for all intents and purposes, been disowned by their father, banished to France, and stripped of all, um, all ties to her home. I don't know if the sisters are jealous of Cordelia, at least certainly not at this stage. They, I think, recognize what Cordelia was doing. And I think, if anything, they say, you know, Cordelia, why, you're being foolish. Just give the old man what he wants. You know, you take this high road, lofty, I'm going to be honest and all this stuff. Well, that to them... I mean, if they believed that themselves, then they would have responded in a similar way that Cordelia did. So they seem perhaps they're, you know, we look at the idea of, remember, this is all taking place in, a, um, in, in the state. Government, right? Rule, authority. And Gonriel and Regan are being pragmatic. I mean, we know that right at the beginning, the, the word is out that Lear is going to divide his kingdom. So the daughters, other than Cordelia in any case, are already thinking in terms of, 
okay, now we are going to have a lot of authority and our husbands are gonna have a lot of authority with us. And now we have to run things. So we have to be pragmatic. We can't be idealistic. Or can we? Can the two go together? When you are in a position of power and authority. And Cordelia's attitude is, I cannot give up my sincerity even for my father. Not, not, not just that I can't give it up in order to obtain power and get a third of the land, um, but I can't give it up in terms of my relationship with my father. So she is very much um, maintaining her integrity as she perceives it. And Regan and, and Godreel are more like, yeah, I get that. But at the same time, right, um, we have things that we have to do now that we have been given that authority and it doesn't, you know, you, you, you know, the integrity issue um, has to be somewhat compromised in order to get things done. Certainly seems to be that that's one of the attitudes they're having because they're going, you know, why wouldn't you just tell him what he wanted to hear? What do, what do you all think of Edmund? We looked at his speech last week. Um, does he have a, does he have a point? A point about what? That he is um, being, whoa. Can you all still hear me? Yes. Okay, something just happened on my screen. What the, okay, weird. Um, I think he is greedy, but does he have like, not, not, to, not to justify or excuse the level of his manipulation of his father and his brother. But does he have a reason to feel angry, frustrated? It's interesting, yes, a greedy, I think he still lives much better than most in kingdom, plus his authority. Well, yeah, I mean, the authority issue, he doesn't really have that much, right, because he is not allowed into that inner circle because of the nature of his birth. But yes, he is still Gloucester's son and he is still acknowledged. Mind you, he's been away for nine years. And Gloucester tells us he's going to send him away again. But I would imagine wherever he sends him, there's never going to be an issue for money because Gloucester does make it clear that he cares about it. He just can't, you know, he just can't, embrace him into his, you know, uh, his castle and his, his position vis-a-vis -vis the authorities in the kingdom. You know, I love him no less than I love my legitimate son, but, you know, he can't, he can't really hang around here. Come, come back for any of you who know Game of Thrones, right? Um, so, I mean, does that, and, and again, this is one of those, um, elements that is, uh, well, challenging for us to, to navigate through. Um, does he have any kind of, not justification for doing what he ends up doing, but justification for being angry and upset? Um, so Lay says, I don't think that Gloucester cares about him, but we had certainly not after, oh, cares about Edmund? Why do you say that? Because if we go back to the very beginning where he, you know, he stipulates that I do care about him. Um, it's just that he's, you know, his mother wasn't my wife, 
and, and there's nothing more I can do about them. But I, I think it's an important point. Um, and, it, and it ties into why Edmund is so um, troubling and troubled. Okay, so it's, he didn't, right, okay, so you're talking about the scene when, but, you know, why is he bleeding? Okay, so there's a couple of things there. If, if you're all following what Leia's saying, it's a good point, right? Yes, at that point, I think that, and we, we, again, we'll, we'll, actually, we really need to jump to the text soon. Um, right, remember, Edmund wounds himself as part of his uh, ruse. Gloucester doesn't ask him if he's okay and so on. I think at that moment, Gloucester is so caught up in the, in, 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 in the idea that his legitimate son, Edgar, just fought with Edmund, wounded Edmund because Edmund refused Edgar's invite to kill Gloucester. So I think what we have there with Gloucester not even asking if he was those okay is because Gloucester's just realizing that his legitimate son is trying to kill him. So I think he's more caught up so I don't think that that, I think we have to rely more on what we heard him say much earlier in terms of how much he does love Edmund and also that he believes Edmund is an indication of how much trust he has in Edmund, which is another reflection of the, how much he cares about Edmund. And it's an important point that, that was brought up earlier because, yeah, you know, Edmund, while he can't be fully embraced into this world, opulent world, um, he does have the love of, of, of his father, even though he's illegitimate. No, it could have been much worse, yes. But at the same time, when we look at it in terms of um, what's fair, let's say. Right? Because it's is not Edmund's whole argument here. He's like, this is not fair. And if it's not fair, it's not right. And since it's not right, why should I accept it? And of course, it plays into authority. Right, and, and Edmund is, has no authority because he's an illegitimate child. So he takes authority. Remember, and he calls up to nature, the natural animalistic world, survival of the fittest, and I'm, he's going to embrace that and go and get what he feels he's entitled to. But of course, once he goes down that path, it can be argued that he's no longer entitled to it because now he's heading down this utterly disruptive path. But he is justifying it through his understanding of nature and the natural order of things. All right, let's, let's go take a look at the text. It's already 9.30. Um, okay. All right, so just to re remind us here, towards the end. We didn't really have a chance to go over much of this. And again, we can't go through the whole play. Um, this whole breakdown with Goneril, right? Remember this? And what you want to, I don't want to go back too far, just a quick review before we get into um, Act Two. So Gonriel enters here, and again, through this whole exchange, when, when 
they start having their conflicts, you're going to see a lot of Lear not seeming to recognize things, right? It comes back to what I was saying earlier about Lear's ability to see properly, to be aware. And we have to be asking ourselves, why isn't he? All right, um, how now, daughter, what makes that front lit on me? Thinks you are too much of late in the frown. Like Anro comes in, she's frowning. And the fool, thou wast a pretty fellow when thou hadst no need to care for her frowning. Now thou art an O without a figure. I am better than thou art now. I am a fool. Thou art nothing. So again, we come back to this nothing. Why, why is the fool saying he's nothing? Yes, right? He gave everything away, everything that defined him as a something. Now, of course, the play on the nothing is, no, there is more to, and Ganriel proved this, right, at the beginning, there is more than just all these accoumons that you have to define yourself. That's one of the themes that we gravitate towards, right? The fool saying you are nothing because you gave away everything that you had. Is it possible then to still be something? Right? Cordelia was stripped of everything she had in that sense, but she still had something, something that France recognized. Right? So the fool here is pointing it out, you've given everything away, so thou art nothing. It's also suggesting that this journey, if you will, that Lear is, is embarking on is a journey to see what is really there when you have all these other elements cast aside. Right? And again, those of you who have read ahead, when he strips himself down in nature, in the storm, and bellows and cries, et cetera, et cetera. Now you're getting closer to seeing what you really are. Because clearly, even from the very start, Lear doesn't fully know who he is. Otherwise, he would have been able to recognize that what he was doing was foolish, both with dividing his kingdom as well as asking his daughter such an outrageous question. Um, all right, let's just take a look at a couple other things here, all right? Uh, Lear, are you our, are you our daughter? Note some of the things that Lear is saying here. Are you my, it doesn't, I, I don't even recognize you anymore. Are, are you my daughter? Come, sir, I would you make us, you, make use of that good wisdom wherever I know you are fraught and put away these dispositions that of late transform you from what you rightly are. Well, what is he, what is he? And note the fool and, you know, I, I next week we'll spend a lot, much more time with the fool. I'll explain why next week I want you to read act three um, and we'll come back to it. But Again, the, what, what the fool is saying, may not an ass know when the cart draws the horse, right? Things are reversed. And Lear again, doth any here know me? This is not Lear. Doth, doth Lear walk thus, speak thus? Where are his eyes? Either his notion weakens, his discernings are lethargied. Ha, waking tis not so. Who is it that can tell me who I am. And of course, the fool will answer that. You are only Lear's shadow. Keep that one in mind. I would learn that for by the marks of sovereignty, knowledge, and reason, 
I should be false persuaded I had daughters. But of course, sovereignty, knowledge, and reason are exactly what Lear is lacking now. And again, the fool playing with it, which, will, which they will make an obedient father. Right? Well, is it the father who's supposed to be obedient or the children who are supposed to be obedient? The fool is constantly reminding Lear that he has changed roles with his children. They now have the authority and he's like the child. And again, McGonagall is pointing out that this our court infected with their manners shows like riotous in. Comes back to again, you know, is 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 gone real in the right? She's saying, you know, you 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 got all these knights here, you're all drunk all the time and you do whatever you want. And of course Lear's attitude is, well, hey, I'm king. Yeah, I, that's that's what I do. Well, no. You're not. And then here, when it gets a little disqualified, quantify your train and the remainder that shall depend to be such men as may be sort your age and know themselves and you. So this is when she's saying, right, you don't need all them. Um, and Lear blows a gasket. Darkness and devils saddle my horses, call my train together. Degenerate bastard, I'll not trouble thee. Yet have I a dot, yet I left Yet have I left a daughter. So it's, it's almost like here now he is doing to Goneril what he did to Cordelia. Right? And you're no longer my daughter. I have one daughter left. Albany is like, you know, pray for be patient. And King Lear to Goneril detested kite, thou liest, my train are men of choice and rarest parts that all particulars of duty know. <laughs> and here again, we note that he is calling back to Cordelia here. Oh, most small fault, how ugly didst thou in a Cordelia show. <coughs> I'm sure what to make of that at this stage. But keep it in mind as we proceed. Oh, love and add to the goal. Oh, Lear, 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 beat at this gate that let thy folly in. And this is right, he's striking his head. He's pounding, this is the gate. He's pounding his head saying, beat at this gate that let thy folly in. There's, there's a slow process of recognition on the part of Lear, but it's slow and it's very ambiguous. Um, but we're seeing it in steps, right? And here, Gonreal, and then when we look at Act Two, when Reagan takes the side of Gonreal and they both together, right? And that's what is going to push him to start heading out into the storm. And the need for that storm to, again, strip him bare. <clears throat> Note as well, when we see him striking his head and some of the things he's saying, it's, it's a continued process of him struggling with awareness. Hear nature, hear dear goddess, hear, suspend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful into her womb, convey sterility, dry up in her the organs of increase. What's he saying here? His whole speech. Very cruel things directed at who? Yeah, 
Yes. He's saying this to his daughter. Now, again, we have to start putting the pieces together. We saw he banished Cordelia. And now, yeah, we, this is why I was emphasize, asking you and, and, and really emphasizing, is gone real wrong here? What is she saying? Yes, she's a bit rude, right? But she's saying, hey, Pops, you're, you're, you know, you got all your, your, your knights here and they're causing trouble. You don't need all this. We, we'll take care of you just fine. So we're looking at Lear's response to that, his behavior and these curses, cursing that his daughter, you know, make this creature into her womb convey sterility. Don't ever let her have children. Or if you do, you know, let them be horrible children that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. What we're getting here is, and this that's why, again, I wish we were in the classroom so I could get more out of you guys, is this sense that Lear feels he is being so wrong. Look, Lear's attitude is, I, I, I gave you my kingdom. I'm your father. And now you are wronging me in on such a level that I am so outraged that I am wishing and cursing you, wishing you to be sterile and cursing you. Where's our sympathy here? Are we going, yeah, Lear, you know, why are you treating your father like that? How dare you? Or are we sitting there saying, Lear, how are you treating your daughter like that? How dare you? So I want to expand on that. What do you mean more towards the kids? Your sympathy is more with them? Yes. Um, it, it's a tough one because, you no. Know, Lear seems not if not in the wrong necessarily as much as he's over the top and the argument can be made right when you when you think of wrong behavior morality ethics and so on underlying that is usually intent and Lear's intent in dividing his kingdom does not seem to be at the beginning in any way malicious, right? It, 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 certainly in his mind, it's very generous. But of course, there's an element of selfishness to it insofar as he wants to relieve himself of all the burdens of being a king. He's getting old. He says it openly. Getting old, I want to I relax in my old age. What's wrong with that? So I'm going to divide my kingdom in, among the three of you. Um, but all I ask in return is that I get to keep a hundred of my knights and I can stay with you in your castles, you know, and, and, and why not just humor the old man? So you see how the sympathy um, can get confused. And of course, at this stage, uh, you know, I, I, I'm emphasizing, I want you to be thinking about this because then when things continue, how your attitudes may change. When you see um, further action on the part of these characters. And again, Lear to Gonriel, life and death, I am ashamed that thou hast power to shake my manhood thus. That these hot tears which break from me perforce should make thee worth them. He's crying in his frustration, his hurt, in his pain. 
and he's angry. You, 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 you have caused me to cry. And then a man doesn't cry, right? That's how upset I am. Uh, blast and fogs upon thee, the untented woundings of a father's curse pierce every sense about you. Right? He's cursing it. Old fond eyes be, be weep this cause again. I'll pluck ye out and cast you with the waters that you lose to temper clay. So I've already alerted you, right? As we always know, eyes are very important in literature, what they symbolize in terms of awareness, what you can see, and so on. Um, eyes are going to become very important here, right? Remember this line. Okay. There is an ongoing theme here of, again, not being able to see what's really going on. And we see it in both plots. We see it with Lear, right? We've just been talking about it. Of course, we see it with Gloucester as well. Because Gloucester can't see that Edmund is the bad guy and Edgar is the good guy. This lack of awareness, lack of clarity, prevents the individual when they're not aware either from, of themselves or their surroundings to being clear in terms of their own understanding of their identity. And what does that mean and suggest? All right, just a couple minutes just to get this wrapped up. Um, Lear leaves. Uh, okay, so the fool goes running after uh, Nuncle Lear, Nuncle Lear. Again, the, the Nuncle is like a very familiar term, like uncle. Um, again, demonstrating this, this relationship that the fool has with Lear. Unlike other relationships that we've seen. And there's a sense, a very strong sense, that the fool, in his own foolish way, is quite fond of Lear. Right? Nuncle Lear, Nuncle Lear. And that the and Lear, remember when Lear is like, Where's my fool? Where's my fool? I need my fool. I haven't seen him in two days. Where's my fool? So be attentive, goes without saying to the fools we get, when you get into act three. That's where we'll talk more about him and his role. I have a question. Yes. When you say fool, are you, mean, are you, are you saying like a comedian or something? Right, so again, the fool is, is like the court jester. Um, in, in, at, at these times, every court had their jester. So the, the court jester was meant to be entertainment for the royalty As a comedian. like a comedian yeah uh like a more a comedian slash clown i guess same thing um that's why we see the fool singing songs he's an entertainer and he can say whatever he wants because as a comedian can so the analogy is is is, is quite apt as a comedian can get away with saying pretty outrageous things because it is um draped in the comedy. So we know it's coming from a comedian, so we make allowances. The well, same idea here with the fool, that the fool can, well, I mean, the fool is more blunt and straightforward with Lear about how foolish he's been than Kent is, right? When Kent just says a couple lines, Lear banishes him on penalty of death. But the fool can continue it because it has that special kind of relationship as a comedian, jester, clown. But there's more to it than just that in this case because there's also a bond between Lear and the fool um, that is quite pronounced. One gets a sense that the fool is not just pointing out these things um, 
but he's pointing them out because he cares. And we certainly get the sense that Lear cares for his fool. Now, especially since Lear is losing his children, right? Right now at this stage, he's like, I've only got one daughter left. All right, Cordelia, I've, I've, I've disowned. Now Gonriel, I'm going to disown you. At least I have Regan. Regan. Um, but there's also the fool. Uh, let's see, we're almost at 10 here. Hold on. So Kent is going to deliver the letter to his other daughter. And again, when we look here at the words of the fool, right? I can't tell how an oyster makes his shell. No, nor, nor I neither, but I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? Why to put his head in? not to give it away to his daughters and leave his horns without a case. Okay. And again, all these exchanges, yes, indeed, thou wouldst make a good fool. If thou wert my fool, uncle, I'd have thee beaten for being old before thy time. Thou shouldest not have been old till thou hadst been wise. Right? So we see the two things going on. One is that Lear is old, and there's that suggestion of senility, and so on. But it's also, you know, the understanding that when you get older, you're supposed to get wider, or wiser. And Lear's actions are not wise. But he thinks they are, because he is basically in that bubble that he created for himself. So he can't see outside that bubble. And the fool is pointing it out to him. And this is where Lear says, oh, let me not be mad, not mad. Sweet heaven, keep me in temper. I would not be mad. So, you know, Lear is, this is a, this is a suggestion, right, of, the coming awareness, and at this stage, the awareness is Lear starting to challenge and question if he's mad. Or, or, or that he's heading down that path. Does he actually believe it at this point? Or is it just hyperbole that he's just all frustrated with the way things are going? Hard to say. All right, um, it's 10 o'clock. We're up to act two here. Um, when we come back, we'll look at act two. Again, I, I still want to, this is why I'm, I'm not going into too much depth with the fool until next week. I, I still want to be sure, and I'm noticing it, and so I'm feeling much better that you're all following the plot. So I want to continue with that in the second half today. Um, we are going to have a quiz, right? So do stick around. Um, and then we're gonna proceed. So when we get to next week, cause then we're getting into the last two, three weeks of the, of the semester is when we're gonna go down into another level. Think of uh, uh, a quiz or assignment, uh, yeah, like we've done in the past. You're going, to do it in, you're going to do it in class for the last uh, half hour, 20 minutes of the class, okay? And then next week, as I said, we're going to go down into more of the layers. Right? Think, of, think of Inception, the movie. We're, we're, we're going to go down to the third, second, and then third dream level, Okay. Um, but you have to have a, a you know, I, I need to be, sh feel comfortable that you're, you're comfortable with the language and understanding the plot at this point before we do, right? And it really does come to a head in that third act, a lot's going to happen. So next week will be a big one and then we'll be wrapping it up shortly thereafter. All right, so 10.30, we're back. 
We look at Act 2. Questions, concerns, please bring them to my attention. And yes, we are going to have an in-class assignment, quiz, whatever you want to call it, um, at the end of class today. All right. We're good. Okay. I'll see you all at 1030. Recording. Go. Um, all right. So let's let's look at Act Two. Remember, as always, these first two acts are setting things up. Right. You, you're 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 getting more and more familiar with Shakespeare. All right. And what we've discovered is usually around that third act is of such vital importance. Right? And in order to fully appreciate what transpires in, at the middle, in the third act, usually in the third act with Shakespeare, um, is, is that familiarity of the foundation that's being laid in acts one and two. Without that understanding and, and familiarity, it's going to be that much more difficult to appreciate and understand what transpires in act three and four, five. Okay, that's why we're spending as much time as we are looking at these first two acts, as we did in the previous Shakespeare's that we've looked at. All right, let's get back to the text. All right, and again, I am encouraging you all to ask questions, draw my attention to areas where you may be struggling, all right? Without your input, I'm just going into, you know, trying to point out some of the more important passages. But again, with your input, we can probably get into the passages that you obviously are having more difficult with, difficulty with. So we start act two and we're back with Edmund. All right, I'm gonna remind you over and over again, look for the similarities between the subplot, Gloucester, Edmund, Edgar, and the main plot, Lear and his daughters. What happens here? So he's talking with Curran here at the beginning. There's a few things that are, you know, that we want to take note of, right? Curran says, nay, I know not. You have heard of the news abroad. I mean the whispered ones, for they are yet but ear-kissing arguments. There's rumors. Not I pray you. What are they? Have you heard of no likely wars toward twixt Dukes of Cornwall and Albany? Right? That harps back to the idea that Lear was doing this to prevent conflict and now we're being informed early on, subtle. Have you heard about the issues between Cornwall and Albany? Not a word. You may do, you may do then in time. That's for our benefit, right? There could be some trouble brewing here. All right, so the Duke is coming there tonight. The better best this weaves itself perforce into my business. My father has set guard to take my brother. Now we're back to the Edmund's plotting and planning and manipulations, right? And he is going to try and take advantage of the Duke of Cornwall and Regan coming here, right? Remember where we are. We're in Gloucester's castle. Everyone's coming here. And that, of course, is drawing our attention to the importance of Gloucester. We want to be attentive to how Gloucester is going to react to all these things. He's got a lot on his plate, Gloucester. Right? He is aware and concerned about what's happening with Lear and his daughters, but he also has to deal with this situation with his own children. 
or particularly one child. Um, so Edgar comes in, um, and here we see Edmund. My father watches, oh, sir, fly this place. He's telling Edgar, you better leave because Gloucester's coming around. No, how he is talking. My father watches. Okay, of course, it's their father. But we're seeing how Edmund now, right, use of language, um, the, the power of oratory skills. We saw that, obviously, in Julius Caesar. Right, and he's saying, have you, have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall? He's using, as did Iago, when situations arise, he takes advantage of them. Have you nothing said upon his party against the Duke of Albany? Advise yourself. And Edgar, of course, always sitting there going, what, I, what, uh, what's going on? I mean, we haven't talked much about Edgar. That's a very important character later on. Right? We're going to see that Edgar is going to leave now, and Edgar is going to adopt a disguise himself. Right? Because he knows everyone's after him. He doesn't know why. Someone has done him wrong doesn't know who. And again, we're all seeing converging here is this central theme of identity. We're seeing Kent's in disguise. We're, we're seeing what we we're talking about earlier, the stripping down of, of the outer layers in order to get closer to who they truly are. And we're even seeing this, this is why I keep coming back to God, Will, and Regan. We're looking at them now, but watch as they start getting, in a sense, stripped down so it is revealed who they truly are. Same thing with Gloucester and Edgar and, of course, Lear. Um, so, again, I hear my father coming, pardon me. He's playing the role. Uh, in cunning, I must draw my sword upon you. Draw, seem to defend yourself, now quit you well. Fly, brother. All right, so Edgar leaves, and this is where Edmund wounds himself, right, to make it more convincing. Gloucester comes in. Uh, Edmund, where's the villain? Here stood he in the dark, his sharp sword out, mumbling of wicked charms, conjuring the moon. <clears throat> to stand with suspicious mistress. We haven't talked about it today, but last week I was drawing your attention to the um, emphasis on astrological signs, superstition, if you will. Remember what Edmund said about that. You know, why, you know, basically belittling it. They, they put all their value on this. So he's going to play that part, right? Conjuring the moon. Um, and this comes back to what was brought up earlier. Someone was saying, you know, Ed Gloucester doesn't seem to really care about Edmund here. Well, yeah, as I said, the reasons being that, you know, he's discombobulated, if you will, because he thinks Edgar is out to kill, to, to kill him now. Uh, bleed, where's the villain Edmund? Fled this way, etc. cetera. Um, and Edmund says, right, so... Persuade me to murder, okay, uh, by no means what, all right, Edmund says, persuade me to murder of your lordship, but that I told him the revenging gods against parasites <laughs> did all their thunders bend. And now he's making it clear. He was trying to persuade me, Edgar was trying to persuade me, Edmund, to kill you, Gloucester, right, to be part of that conspiracy to kill their father. Um, playing on the unnatural purpose. And of course, this comes back again to this idea of what is natural. Edmund is railing against the understanding of the natural order of things, creating his own natural order, if you will. Uh, when I dissuaded him from his intent and found him plight to do it with cursed speech, I threatened to discover him, replied, thou unpossessing bastard, dost thou think if I would stand against thee with the reposal 
of any trust, virtue, or worth in the make thy words faith. He's, again, he's playing the part. Heart back to Iago here. Uh, strong and fast villain, would he deny his letter? I remember the letter, the letter that Edmund forged. Um, hark the Duke's trumpet, and I know not why he comes, all ports all bar, the Duke coming now, the villain shall not escape, the Duke must grant me that besides his picture, Edgar's, I will send far and near that all the kingdom may have the due note of him. Okay, so he's going to send out a picture. Find it, find this Edgar who's now plotted against me, my son. And then, and of my land, loyal and natural boy, I'll work the means to make thee capable. What's that mean? What's he saying there? He's promising him the land. Yeah. I think he would be giving him something. He's saying that he's going to work towards getting Edmund those very lands that Edmund was so frustrated that he's not entitled to because he's a bastard child. Now that Edgar's out of the picture in Gloucester's mind, he is now turning to his other son, who he's always expressed love for, but cannot accommodate because of the nature of his birth. And now he's saying, of my land, loyal and natural boy. It's not how he referred to him earlier. It was unnatural because it came out of wedlock. Now... All right, so there's a commentary there, a very strong one. And this is something you want to be attentive to with Gloucester. The suggestion is, yes, these, this natural order of things in this society, which dictates that a bastard child is not entitled to lands because he was or she was conceived unnaturally, He's now referring to him as natural. And it says a lot about Gloucester. Is Gloucester now, in a sense, subverting that same natural order that Edmund is very consciously subverting? For Gloucester, it's only coming after things go awry with his natural son, Edgar. Suggesting that if circumstances lend themselves to it, that the weak can, in fact, modify that societal imposed natural order. And again, note how subtle it is. Because as soon as he says it, we got a bit of a shift and Cornwall and Reagan come in. Okay? Again, these are the things. Drawing your attention to them. Um, how's it going? Oh, madam, my old heart is cracked. It's cracked. What did my, my father's godson seek your life? Oh, he who my father named your Edgar, oh, lady, lady, shame would have it hid. Ringham, was he not companion with the riotous knights that tend upon my father? Okay, look what she's doing here. She's saying, because again, Right, the, the, the Reagan and Gunreal talking about the riotous nights, right? The, the, the entourage that Lear brings, which they are going to reduce to basically nothing, right? Remember, anytime you see nothing. Um, and now she's, a, she's um, asking, well, was Edgar part of them, right? Because that would make sense to her. Like, why is she asking that? What are we to make of that? Is it her, again, in a sincere manner, really pointing out that those riotous nights are disruptive and dangerous to the state? Because if Edgar is part of them, and Edgar is plotting uh, to kill his father, right? 
yeah, she's trying to put plots together, but at this point it seems like she's just speculating, which indicates or suggests that she is sincere in her belief that Lear's entourage are a danger, right? So it takes it out of just the personal, that it's annoying, but now by including Edgar, believing Edgar is now disruptive to the state, into that entourage of riotous knights, it would then give more justification for getting rid of those knights since they are now disruptive to the state, not just to their peace and quiet because they're partying all night. Okay. Uh, Gloucester said, I don't know. But of course, Edmund seizes the opportunity. Yes, madam, he was of that consort. Of course, he never was. Uh, and Cornwall, now, Edmund, I hear that you have shown your father a childlike office, right? So now it's important, again, laying the foundation for things to alert, alert us to things that we need to be attentive to as we proceed. This relationship between Cornwall and Edmund seems to be something here. And you want to watch how Edmund now, we've just seen Edmund working this plot against his father and trying to destroy Edgar. But now we're going to see how the two plots come together. Um, for you, Edmund, whose virtue and obedience doth this instant so much commend itself, you shall be ours. Natures of such deep trust we shall much need. Okay, so we have a couple of things here. Again, nature. Always looking at that. Trust, right? When the heart's up back, oh, a little trustworthy and, and, and honest Iago. <laughs> and that we will need this, of course, but Edmund is not to be trusted. And the nature element is a little more convoluted. We'll be talking more about nature and what the different manifestations of that concept of nature are explored in this play as we proceed. But we've already had a good taste of it from Edmund. And that famous soliloquy in the first act. Uh, so then we get into this second scene. Uh, with Oswald and Kent. Now, it's an interesting scene, and it and it 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 does. I've always found, you know, Kent, who is, you know, the one who stands up to Lear at the beginning, and is as a result is banished. And now he's back in disguise. It's important to remember anyone who's in disguise. That's not their true self. But the true self is lurking somewhere in there. And he's. You know, he's insulting Oswald. Why dost thou use me thus? I know thee not. Oswald doesn't recognize him. Fellow, I know thee. A lot of this, you know, who is it? He's here, Lear saying, who, who is this woman? This is my daughter? And who am I? Every time you're seeing that, be attentive. Um, fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know f me for? And here comes, again, one of the... I just got to go through it real quick. It's a knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, a base, proud, shallow, beggarly, three-suited, hundred-pound, filthy, worsted stocking knave, a lily-livered, action-taking knave, a whoreson, glass-gazing, super-serviceable, finical rogue, one trunk inheriting slave, one that wouldst be a bod in way of good service and art nothing but the composition of a knave, beggar, coward, pander, and the son and heir of a mongrel bitch, one whom I will beat into clamorous whining if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition. So it brings me back to what I was saying earlier. What's Kent doing here? I mean, it's over the top. 
I mean, it's, a, it's great with, <laughs> it's great. The language is, you know, fantastic. You ever looking for insults that you want to find, look to your Shakespeare, they're, they're, they're all over. And Oswald's response again, what, 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 what a monstrous fellow art thou thus to rail on one that is neither known of thee nor knows thee. Now, of course, they have encountered each other before. Oswald just doesn't remember. But again, as we were looking at Gonrill and Regan, are they doing anything wrong here? And they don't seem to. I asked the same question. Yeah, is Oswald doing anything wrong? Oswald doesn't even recognize him. And suddenly this guy jumps out of the blue and starts calling him all these names. To deny thou knowest me, is it two days ago since I tripped up thy heels and beat thee before the king? Remember, that's what, when Kent and, and the king attacked Oswald because Oswald was being rude, on orders to be rude. Draw, you rogue, rogue, for though it be night, yet the moon shines. I'll make a sop of the moonshine of you. Draw, you horse on culinary barber monger. Draw, and he draws a sword. So, again, why is Kent, is he, right? We're asking yourself, is he overly temperamental here? All right, he's angry at Oswald and so on, but is there other reasons for this over-the-top behavior? Hmm. And away, I'm not going to fight you. I have nothing to do with you. Draw, you rascal. You come with letters against the king. Right, he's bringing letters from Gonril. And take vanity of the puppet's part against the royalty of her father. Draw, you rogue, or also carbonado your shanks draw you rascal come your ways help ho murder help strike you slave stand rogue stand you meet slave strike and he beats him up right because he is the messenger of gonril so kent is seemingly defending lear defending the king and this is where Kent gets to be, you know, complex character because Kent was the first to acknowledge that, you know, you're not, you're not behaving properly, King Lear. But of course it was directed specifically to the situation with, um, uh, with Cordelia. So yes, Kent is very loyal to Lear, but he, does Kent not recognize that Lear, as we've been discussing, is no longer king. He's acting and behaving in a manner that would suggest you have insulted the king, therefore I'm entitled to beat you. But as we've discussed, Lear is no longer truly the king. He doesn't have the authority. He believes that Lear was mistreated, but that's one of the questions we're asking. Was Lear mistreated if Lear's knights, his entourage, were as disruptive as they were? We talk about how Gonriel and Oswald, who was told by Gonriel to be rude to Lear, but is, is Lear and his knights not being rude themselves by, you know, camping out and being disruptive and feeling they can do whatever they want? when he has given up that authority. And keep in mind, while Kent is doing this, being loyal to Lear and seemingly defending Lear, he is in disguise. It's not really Kent. Edmund comes in and the rest. Um, what's going on here? Weapons, arms, what's the matter? You know, the whole gang, what did it speak? I am scarce of breath. Oswald then explains. And, and what, what happened, what, what transpired? Thou art a strange fellow, a tailor made a man. All this stuff here is Kent's, Kent's dialogue here. I, a tailor, sir, a stone cutter or painter could not have made him so ill though he had been but two hours at the trade. Speak yet, how grew your quarrel? What's going on? Stop beating around the bush. 
And Oswald says this ancient ruffian, notice the emphasis on the age. This ancient ruffian, Kent is arguably around 50 years old. All right? Uh, this ancient one whose life I have spared at suit of his gray beard. Oswald was saying I didn't attack him because he's, he's an old guy and he's acting ridiculous. Wait a minute. An old guy who seems to be acting ridiculous. Sound like someone else we know? And Kent continues the horse on Zed, thou unnecessary letter. Uh, the, the insults are great, and but over the top. And we've seen how Lear has been over the top as well. And Cornwall says, stop. Know you no reverence? And Kent says, yes, sir, but anger hath a privilege. What's Kent doing there? Is he suggesting... <coughs> that um, he knows he's overdoing it, but because he's angry, that allows for it, that's acceptable, right? It's an, it's an interesting commentary. He seems to almost be acknowledging that he is overreacting, but because I'm angry, therefore, And if anger has its privilege, then why art thou angry? That such a slave as this would wear sword who wears no honesty. Such smiling rogues as these, like rats, oft bite the holy cords of twain, which are too intrinsic, unloosed, smooth every passion than the natures of their lords rebel. Right? That his, his anger at Oswald is seemingly a, a, an accumulation of anger about a lot of things, not the least of which is that he's banished, and it's all directed at Oswald, right? And, and note as well, I mean, he's, he's putting it all on this idea that he's so angry. Is he fully aware of why he's angry? Because, you know, remember, he confronted Lear. He told Lear, what are you doing? Don't do this. And Lear ignored him. Not only ignored him, didn't even ignore him, banished him on penalty of death so that he has to come back in disguise. Could some of his anger, without him realizing it, remember the idea of awareness, could some of his anger be anger at Lear for doing the foolish things that Lear has done, but he can't direct it at Lear because he still has reverence for Lear? And if so, is that reverence misguided? And Corno says, why, art thou mad, old fellow? Does that sound familiar? Why, art thou mad, old fellow? Anyone? Have we heard something similar to this? What is... Yeah, someone said that to Lear. Who said that to Lear? Kent! <laughs> And now it's being said to him. Seeing the, the connections, the parallels. He says to, he said to Lear, art thou mad, old man, for banishing Cordelia? And now the same thing is being asked of him by Cornwall. Are you mad, old fellow? Your behavior is seemingly irrational. Kent called out Lear on that in relation to Cordelia, and now Kent himself is being called out on it by Cornwall, suggesting that Kent's actions here are a reflection of Lear's actions in that first act, which at that point Kent could recognize as being mad. 
but he doesn't seem now to be able to recognize that perhaps he is behaving in the same way. And we're alerted to that by this line. Uh, in praying blood doth affect Sosio and constrains the garb quite from his nature. He cannot flatter. He is an honest man, mind and plain. He must speak truth. Okay, so this whole exchange ultimately leads to what? Into the stocks. So note again, though, and, and I know it's, it's a lot here, but bear with me. Um, what's that, what's, what meanest by this? I, to go out of my dialect, which you discommend so much, I know, sir, I am no flatterer. Okay. I am no flatterer. Where have we seen flatterers before? Okay. Those are the sisters who flattered Lear. He that beguiled you in a plain accent was a plain knave, which for my part I will not be, though I should win your displeasure to entreat me to it. What is this now reminding us of? I am no flatterer. And I will not flatter you even if that will win your displeasure. throwing shade to the sisters and doing what else though? I am no flatterer. Who else was not a flatterer? Who chose not to flatter even though she knew it would cause displeasure. Exactly. And again, this is the type of thing. You want to be spotting and recognizing and marking down the third daughter, Cordelia. And Corin says, what, what, what was the offense? I never gave him any. It pleased the king, his master, very late to strike at me. Okay, so we're still seeing him referred to as king. And, and that's the whole point, is what is he? Is he, is he technically is still king, but by giving up his authority, he isn't. He's in, it's, it's that liminal space where the identity is floating. It doesn't know where it is. Is he king? Isn't he king? If he's not king, what is he? That again comes back to his entourage, the knights, as a symbol of his authority, which the sisters strip him of. Um, and Cornwall says, fetch, uh, fetch forth the stocks, you stubborn, ancient knave, you reverend braggart, will teach you. And, sir, I am too old to learn. Huh? Again, we're seeing another reflection, a continued reflection through Kent of Lear. Sir, I am too old to learn. Is he? Is Lear too old to learn? Call not your stocks from me. I serve the king on whose employment I was sent to you. You shall do, no, you shall do small respect, show too bold malice against the grace and person of my master stalking his messenger. He's telling you, you can't. I am the king's messenger. And therefore, if you do this to me, you will be showing disrespect to the king. Corona says, fetch forth the stocks. Uh, as I have life and honor, there shall he sit till noon. And note the sister. Till noon, till night, my lord. And all night, too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. And her response, sir, being his knave, I will. 
This is a fellow of the self same color our sister speaks of. Come, bring away the stocks. So again, we're having this battle of authority. He's making it clear. I am the king's messenger. You can't do this to the king's messenger. And she says, oh, we can do it. We're going to do it. And you have no say in it. Because Regan and Pagonriel, he is no longer king. People aren't realizing that. But put them at the back. Nope. Yeah. Note Gloucester's response. The stocks are brought out, and Gloucester says, Let me beseech your grace not to do so. His fault is much, and the good king, his master, will check him for it. Let the king meet, do the punishment. His fault is much. Let the good king, his master, meek out the punishment, not you. So Gloucester, as well, is still seeing Lear as the king. Or does he? Right? This is what they're all struggling with right now. The king must take it ill that he so light, slightly valued in his messenger should have him thus restrained. And Cornwall says, I'll answer to that. And Reagan said, my sister may receive it much, much more worse to have her gentleman abused and assaulted. So here it is really in a nutshell. Yes, you're saying that the king, this is his messenger and the king will be upset, but my sister's gonna be upset because he was abusing her messenger unthinkable to make that comparison before he divided his kingdom. Kent is put in the stocks. All right, and note with Gloucester here, um, I am sorry for thee, friend, tis the Duke's pleasure whose disposition all the world well knows will not be rubbed nor stopped. I'll entreat for thee. I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do for you. And he says, pray do not, sir. I have watched and traveled hard. Sometime I shall sleep out. The rest I'll whistle. A good man's fortune may grow out at heels. Give you good morrow. And kept saying, no, you don't have to help me. I get, you know, what am I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sleep a little bit. I'll whistle until they release me from the stocks. And then we have this bit from Kent. It's an important one. Good king that must approve the common saw thou out of heaven's benediction comes to the warm sun. Approach thou beacon to this under globe that by thy comfortable beams I may pursue this letter. Nothing almost sees miracles but misery. I know it is from Cordelia who hath most fortunately been informed of my obscured course. Cordelia knows what Kent is going through and shall find time from this enormous state seeking to give losses their remedies. All weary and overwatch take vantage, heavy eyes not to behold this shameful lodging. And fortune, good night, smile once more, turn thy wheel. Remember, I told you to be attentive to the idea of fortune. He is putting it off as part of the wheel of fortune turning. And at this moment, he is in the stocks. But he has a letter from Cordelia. Cordelia stipulating she's aware of the situation and will do what she can. And then he sleeps. I'm going back here, you know, don't, you know, pray do not, sir. I have watched and traveled hard. And sometime I shall sleep out the rest. So Kent's an intriguing character here. Now, let's get through as much of this as we can by 1130. Edgar. What's he going to do here? Remember, Edgar is running, thinking that Edmund is trying to protect him. Because someone is saying bad things that he's done. Um, and now he is on the run. And what he does here, yes, another 
disguise. Not just as a homeless man, but as one of the Bedlam beggars. The Bedlam beggars, at the time, it would have been known to the audience then, Tom of Bedlam was a, a, a stock character, if you will. These are people, beggars, who have been released from insane asylums. Now, something starts to come together here a little bit that you want to be attentive to. Edgar is now going to disguise himself as one of the bedlam beggars. Tom, poor, as he calls himself, poor Tom, Tom of Bedlam. Again, it would be a recognizable character. At the time, a character who has been released from an insane asylum, stripped down as a beggar, tied into the idea of madness. And as such, able to function in this capacity as a madman beggar in the society without the repercussions that a normal, regular person would have to adhere to. Right? I mean, think of it in terms of when, when, when you see someone of this nature who may be yelling in the street or carrying on, you know, we make allowance for that, for, for that because of where they're coming from. Well, who else has that kind of, in a sense, privilege to be able to speak and say whatever they want? The fool. So now there's a connection here. As the fool has that ability because he is the fool to say things that no one else could say, Edgar, in putting himself in this particular disguise, will allow him to behave and do things that any other disguise would not allow him to do. We see this with Kent, who puts on a disguise, but it's not a disguise of a bedlam beggar. Yes, okay, so it seems as though insane people and the fool are allowed to speak as they wish because regular people can brush it off as they please if they don't like it, but if a regular person says the same thing, they can face consequences. Yes, very much so. To what extent is what we have to look at. All right, but that, that's, that's what I, exactly what I want you to be observing at this point, especially with Edgar now, because we don't know much about Edgar. Right, and note how you know I heard myself proclaimed by the happy hollow of the tree escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. Whilst I may escape, I will preserve myself. Right, I, I'm he's trying to think how am I going to survive here? Everyone's after me. I will preserve myself and am be thought to take the b basest and most poorest shape. I'll note the word basest. Where have we heard that before? Base, base. That goes back to Edmund's soliloquy. When he's saying, everyone just looks at me as base, you know, as, as, as uh, unimportant. lowest yes so here we're seeing edgar i will disguise myself in this as a bedlam beggar so that i'll look like the most basest and most poorest shape that ever pendry and contempt of man brought near to beast near to beast i almost like a beast and again there these are beggars that came out of insane asylums and were looked at often as no more than just beasts my face I'll grime with filth, blanket my loins, elf my hair in knots, 
and with presented nakedness outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. He is ripping off his clothes, blanket, just a blanket to cover his loins, tying his hair into knots and covering his face with filth and dirt. Yes, Edgar at this stage has lost all his privilege because Edmund worked his manipulation well enough that Gloucester and Cornwall, because Gloucester's told Cornwall and Regan, are hunting him, believing him to have attempted to plot to kill Gloucester, his father. And as such, Edgar recognizing this because Edmund has told him, right, of course, a roundabout way, is in order to disguise himself and hide from the powers that are chasing him, he is going to lower himself into the basest, lowest, poorest shape he can. Now, of course, that makes sense literally because that helps with the disguise, but there is that symbolic, figurative, metaphorical component here. He is stripping himself down to the basest level. We've been talking about that. All right, we're seeing something similar happening to Lear as he's being stripped, right? Strips himself of his power, and now, thinking he still has it, others are stripping away his entourage, his authority, his privilege, and stripping him down towards his most base manifestation. Just like Edgar's doing willingly here as part of his disguise. Again, making the connections. You're seeing how all these characters and the plots are starting to show the threads that connect them. And we have to follow those threads to see how much they come together and how much as a unit they are going to address these overarching themes of identity, madness, relationships, fathers, children, all these things that we've been exposed to. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified bare arms, bare arms, pines, wooden bricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary, and with this horrible object from low farms, poor pelting villages, sheep coats and mills, sometime with lunatic band, sometimes with prayer, enforce their charity. Poor Turley God, poor Tom, you'll see this, we'll be revisiting this, Tom of Bedlam, that's something yet. Edgar, I nothing am. He is stripping off his identity as Edgar. Edgar, I nothing am. I am poor Tom. Now he's doing it again to hide, right, to stay safe. But remember his predicament. This is a guy who was just going about his everyday loving son to his father. And suddenly, is it because of the wheel of fortune? Through no action of his own, he is being hunted. He's lost everything. He has to shed everything that he was in order to escape. But it's also a reflection of what has been imposed upon him. And we're always, remember, we're seeing this. We're, again, with Edmund's manipulations, um, 
we see it as well in contrast to a large extent with Lear, who is going, and you'll see, especially in Act Three, a sim going through the similar situation. But with Lear, the big difference is he initiated it. With Edgar, he had, doesn't even know how this all came about. Lear doesn't know how it all came about, but we know that his actions were a part of it. Edgar, we none of his actions were. And yet, you'll see how they are going to converge into the same place and tying it in with the nothing again. What is nothing? Keep the nothing in mind. The play starts with the concept of nothingness. And yet it's a challenge for us to reflect on what, that what is perceived as nothing can actually be something. If that makes sense. All right, remember Cordelia stripped of everything. She's nothing, she's disowned. She starts off by saying, what well, can you say they earn you a part more opulent than your sisters? Nothing, my lord. Nothing will come of nothing, says Lear to her. And yet even with her stripped down into this nothingness, there was no dowry, no lands, no title, France recognizes that she's something. Edgar, nothing I am. Is there something in there that will show that there is, Edgar still is there? something that is other than what is normally perceived as those elements that define identity, define the person. That those clothings, if you will, I mean it metaphorically, that we wear as identifying who we are is actually masking and hiding who we are. And the only way we can know who we actually are is to rip them off, as Edgar is doing here. Not because he's worried about finding out his true identity, no. By circumstances that have been imposed upon him, but what will that yield in terms of his understanding of his identity? All these disguises. Oh boy, it's almost time for your little quiz. Let's see where we're at here. Um, so very important bit here. And it's the first time we're really getting a lens into Edgar. I'll always be noting structurally where all this happens. Um, Okay, this is a fairly lengthy and important scene that I will want to spend more time with. So we'll come back next week, pick it up from this scene, and go into Act 3. I would suggest, obviously, read Act 3, but if you have the time, if you can manage to make the time, Read scene four of act two again. And as that segues into act three, because I, I do want to spend more time with this. Um, and I think it, it's, it's an opportunity for you to come to this now. Be attentive to the fool, because we're going to start really talking about the fool in starting next week. I mean, we've already been talking about him. But now looking at what transpires here with Reagan, um, confirming much of what we've been talking about, about the stripping down um, and revealing the basis level of a person's humanity. Note the role of the fool throughout this. We are not ourselves when nature being oppressed commands the mind to suffer with the body. And look how it's going to segue into um, 
the next act. Note with Reg, oh, sir, you are old. Nature and you stands on the very verge of her confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Okay. This is, I hope you're picking up on this. and I will come back to it, but note this. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Key thing. You don't know yourself. You need to be led by those who know you better than you know yourself. Right? Um, and watch, we've already been seeing it when you go through this, uh, if, when you review it, and we'll touch on it, if you don't have time, just get to act three. But keep in mind, when you reflect on it, thinking of Edgar stripping himself down, putting dirt all over himself, basically bringing himself low base like an animal. And reflect upon that in terms of these themes of nature we've been talking about. A base animal stripped bare of everything reveals our true nature, part of which is animalistic. Right, that ties back into Edmund who is going to use that innate animalistic quality of just forget all your rules and your worshiping of the astrology and, and all this nonsense in his mind. That's not true nature. True nature is you go and do what you want to do to get what you feel you can get. Also, before, and I'll finish up right now, before we go to the quiz, be thinking at this point, we haven't talked much about it, but we're going to have to. Now be also incorporating into your thoughts ideas of morality and ethics. I've been kind of hinting at that, where I'm saying, what do you think of God and Will and Regan? Are they right? Are they wrong? Right? In terms of now, when you get to Act Three, keep that in mind and relate it to the idea with Edmund and to some degree Edgar now, because of where Edgar has brought himself, but Edmund who was very consciously challenging and subverting the societal order of things, which also speaks to the idea of morality and ethical behavior. How, do, how does anyone, determine what is proper moral and ethical behavior. Edmund is behaving in an incredibly, what we would conceive and what everyone seen in this world would, immorally and unethically, and yet he justifies it. You have, you have neglected me. You have pushed me out of your societal world, your rules, your regulations. They, therefore, they no longer apply to me. I don't have to adhere to your sense of morality, your sense of ethics. I will determine those qualities, those ideas, that ideology on my own as one with nature, not one within the construct of a society. And once I go there, then your rules don't apply to me, especially those more ephemeral rules of morality and ethics, which then leads him to be able to do whatever he wants. Everyone else at this stage is still bound. Gloucester is going after Edgar because he believes what Edgar has done is so horribly immoral and unnatural because morality and ethics are tied in to the perception and understanding of what is natural. Edmund challenges that. And now we're going to see how others who are thrust into situations are going to have to reflect on that as well. Fun stuff. 
Right. Okay. So um, I'm going to put up the quiz. It's really basic. Just let me get to it and post it. Um, we are TBE here. Let's go to it. Okay, so it's uh, going to put it up now, and you will have till 12. Okay. Uh, and hold on, we'll be there in a sec. All right, it should be up. So everyone check and make sure you can see it. I'm going to just quickly put it up here, but you'll see no 12 like in 30 minutes, not 12 o'clock tonight. Um, you'll see, uh, and I'll just put it up on the screen so we can all see it. It's really basic. Why is Kent placed in the stocks? You can do as much with this as you choose. You can, this can be answered obviously in two or three sentences. You can expand on it, I leave it to you. How much you wanna say about it, okay? Um, these in-class assignments are not designed to be difficult or to trip you up. It's just to make sure that you're thinking and staying alert and attentive during the classes and when you're reading. All right, and it'll give me, by based on your responses, it'll give me a clearer picture of how much more I have to go into certain areas and not. That's why it's so basic. Would you like us to answer the question on that exact document you just sent us now and then submit on Omnibox? That would be the best way I would suggest, right? Because that's a Word document. What I need it, I need it in the, as a Word document so you can just go right into that document, write your answer out. There's plenty of room on that page. You're certainly not going to need more than that. And then upload it through Omnibox in the assignment, and you have until 12 o'clock to do it. Thank you. Okay? Everyone good with that? When you finish, you can go. I have a question. I don't see that. The, like, did you write the question? or do you, I don't see it on the... Okay, why, you don't see it say, why is Kent placed in the stocks? No. I can just copy it, but I don't see it on the... Is anyone else having trouble seeing it? Everyone else, you could... Can... I didn't get it. Did someone get it? Uh, I get it. I can see the question. Okay, so just try to refresh your page, those of you who don't see it yet. You should all have it. What was the question again? It's in your assignment portal in Omnibox. So do we have a word limit or what nope. kind of we gonna... what, Whatever you want. Okay. Okay, so everyone, you have to go to the Omnibox, go to our class, hit, hit the assignment. Same thing you had to do when we did our midterm and then respond by uploading it in the same manner. Is that good? Okay, I'm gonna take it that that's a yes, that you guys all see it now. I don't see it, but it's okay, I copy it from the others. Thank you. Okay, but be sure you upload it through the Omnivox assignment portal. I did. Okay. That's, that's the only thing, because otherwise I'm not going to be able to see it. Okay. All right, and um, I'll, I'll keep you alerted as to what time we're at. And keep in mind, you're going to have at least 
one more of these, if not two more, of, of similar, or as I said, I'll, I'll think about giving you maybe a couple of days to do it. We'll see how things go. Sure, did you say you were gonna give a certain amount and then we can discard one of them? Yeah, that's why I'm gonna try and give you as many as I can and then I will take the best of what we have. Okay. All right, so you should have at least four, I'll take the three best, All right? You, you have one already, this will be the second, so there'll be two more. How long does it have to be exactly? I'm not sure if you said it. Right. Yeah, it, I, I leave it to you. I mean, I would I would suggest that you would look at anywhere from three to, to six sentences, like a paragraph, you know, expand on it, but you know, don't just use filler. It can be answered very simply, it can be answered in one or two sentences, but you might want to expand on that a little bit, just to give me an understanding that you understand context, right? That there's more to just what he did, but you know, you know why did he do it? Even though you can't answer that exactly, just show me some connections. But again, should be no more than than a, than a small paragraph. If you want to write more, go right ahead. But there's no need. And, and please, Word document, please.
Sir, when you're finished, do you just submit it and that's it? Yep, just submit it and um, then uh, you're done for the day with me. Perfect. Have a great day, sir. You too.